Um, hi, everyone. I want to thank you so much for being here today for influ in infusing inclusion, embracing equity in nursing education. This is the first in a series of conversations about bringing diversity, equity, and inclusion to your classroom and institution. Following this presentation by Tiffany Gibson, there will be time for a few questions. Um, uh, please feel free to share your questions in the Q&A section or the chat box. You can direct them to the group or directly to Unbound Medicine. We're very excited to have Ms. Gibson to share this information. And without further ado, we are going to begin. Hello, welcome to Unbound Medicine's Nursing Education, Infusing Inclusion and Embracing Equity series. This is session one, Foundations of Diversity, Equity and Inclusion. And throughout this series, we're going to be talking about ways that you can infuse and embrace diversity, equity and inclusion in your nursing curriculum. The overview for this particular session is going over diversity, equity, and inclusion terms, level setting on what equity and belonging is, and perception of diversity, equity, and inclusion in nursing, but from a student standpoint. I'm going to be your host and facilitator, Tiffany Gibson, known as a professional troublemaker. I am a board certified professional development specialist nurse educator, clinical leader, um, and like to spend a lot of my time helping healthcare workers, specifically nurses, on infusing emotional intelligence in their work, psychological safety in their practice, and embracing diversity, inclusion, and belonging for all. So let's get right into it. Before we can have a conversation about diversity, equity, and inclusion, we first need to know what these definitions really mean and what the terms are. Because as we know, society's interpretation of words and what the true meaning and definition of terms are may not always be the same. And so diversity is differences, right? It's distinction, assortment, variance in ways that things or people may differ. When we speak about diversity in this particular sense, we're mainly talking about race, ethnicity, gender, sexual expression, cultural traditions, as well as diversity of thought. Diversity can sometimes be used as a synonym for race. So sometimes I will hear, Tiff, we have a diversity issue. But what they really mean is we have a racial issue or racism has occurred. But because diversity is a nicer term, and more palatable, that's what's used. But if we're going to talk directly about issues affecting people and how they're being treated and behavior, then we wanna make sure that we're using the proper terms. And we wanna make sure that we call a spade a spade and we use terms in its full totality to have a good understanding of what's being said. Inclusion is a sense of belonging, it's embracing the diversity, and inclusion is where you have environments that are welcoming and respectful to people in groups that are different. You value the differences and you support it. And this way, people are able to fully participate and show up as their full self. With equity, you're talking about access and opportunity and advancement for all, identifying and eliminating barriers to allow people to have full participation in anything that they want to be a part of. Equity is not the same as equality. And as a nurse educator, it's really important for you to note this difference with your students. It's not enough for a nurse to say, I treat all my patients the same, because you don't. Some patients may be a two-person assist. Some patients may be a wheelchair user. Some patients may be completely independent. And due to that, you will give them different accommodations to allow them to participate in their care as much as possible. It's important that we start our nursing students off with this information and understanding that it's not necessarily equality that matters, but equity that's really important in how to give patient care. 
And so with this visual, I love that it breaks down the four different types of access that we currently have going on. So to the far left, we have reality, which is currently what's happening in the world, where some people have more than others. That could be a privilege, that could be more access to opportunity, and because of that, they have an unfair advantage. Then you have equality, which is everyone gets the same thing, but even with everyone getting the same thing, there's still an unfair advantage for people who are starting off behind the eight ball. Either they are underserved, um, they from an underutilized population or they are marginalized. And so equality, while it sounds good, still isn't enough to allow people to participate. And then there's equity, where you are giving individualized accommodations for people, for them to show up as their full authentic self and participate with everyone else. But what we really need is liberation, the removal of barriers, the removal of obstacles, so that we don't have to think about what access and accommodations look like and people can experience life as is across the board. With your nursing students, we want to strive for equity as much as possible, making sure that they understand regarding for their patients, but even with themselves, that there may be some accommodations that they need in order for them to fully participate in the classroom in clinical and further on in their profession as a nurse. Here's another favorite visual of mine that basically goes over the same thing. This is from the book, The Giving Tree, where you can see the four different types of opportunities, obstacles, and challenges. But what we really want in the end is justice, where we're fixing the system across the board to offer equal access to both tools and opportunities. And so there isn't any mishaps, miscommunication, or injustice in regards to equity and equality. So going back into the terms, we have racism. Racism is a social construct that's based on a belief that race is a fundamental determinant of human traits and capabilities. And that due to these traits and capabilities, there are huge differences that makes one race superior than another. And in America, that superior race is the white race. Prejudice is preconceived opinions that's not based on reason or facts. Discrimination is the behavior of prejudice. So while prejudice is the thought of the opinion, discrimination is the actual action, the unjust or prejudicial treatment of people due to their differences. Bigotry is intolerance to differences. And implicit bias is attitudes associated with stereotypes without conscious knowledge. Implicit bias can also lead to microaggressions where unbeknownst to the person who is performing the microaggression, they are offending the person who is deemed to be different by asking questions that may be very disrespectful. Another term that I would like to bring up is reverse racism. There isn't a such thing as reverse racism by going off of this particular definition of what racism is. Because of racism, is a fundamental determinant of human traits and capacities, making one race inferior than another, then in situations where there may be discrimination or stereotype or prejudice, reverse racism did not occur. And so we want to make sure that as we're talking with students and they are telling of stories, incidences, or any antidote that they may have been a part of or heard, that we are helping them use the correct term so that they understand the meaning because words do matter. So in level setting with your students, we want to make sure that we are using the same language across the board to make sure that everybody has the same information and that we're working together towards the common goal. As it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion, we also want to remind them that inclusive groups by definition are diverse. However, diverse groups isn't always inclusive. What makes a diverse group inclusive is the sense of belonging. If you are enrolling applicants into your program to fill quota, to make sure that you have a diverse cohort, we wanna make sure that we are allowing the people who were enrolled due to their diversity to be their full authentic self. So what do I mean? If you're hiring someone 
who does not speak English as their primary language, allowing them to express themselves or talk amongst themselves in their traditional tongue should be accepted. If you're saying that African-Americans are allowed to be in the program, then having their hair grown naturally as it comes out of their head should be accepted and labeling them unprofessional due to the kinks and coils of their hair, it's not inclusive. To say that you have one Asian, two males, three women, and one Muslim to check off things on a checklist is not enough to say that you are a diverse cohort. How are you using the thoughts, the traditions, the cultures of, the, of these different peoples to enhance the learning in your classroom and to get different points of view? That is an inclusive and belonging environment. Also remind your students that equity also involves justice and fairness and making sure that procedures and processes within institutions and systems are distributing the resources evenly and as needed per the requests of the people who need them. Equity also includes empathy. And that is something that we should be teaching our students from the classroom so that they will be able to put it into practice once they get to the unit. So perceptions of diversity, equity, and inclusion in nursing means that it's not enough for us to talk about ways that we can be culturally competent to our patients only, but to ourselves, our peers, our students, our professors, the other people in the workforce. As nurses, we have that responsibility to promote health equity through practice and to understand the complexity of diversity, equity, and inclusion and the intersection that it has with healthcare. Now, this is something that may not be able to be easily translated in the classroom setting. However, when your students have clinical opportunities or brings up different instances that they've experienced either working as a tech or a CNA, we wanna make sure that we point out intersections of diversity, equity, and inclusion in healthcare. For example, saying that African-Americans have high blood pressure as um, a health disparity is not enough because the color of my skin and the amount of melanin that I have in my body does not automatically make me prone to hypertension. My race, which is a social construct, does not make me prone to hypertension. What does is my living conditions, my socioeconomic standards, my level of education, my access to healthcare and healthy foods. Those things increases stress, increases the amount of sodium I may be eating, and does it allow me to check on my numbers and my vital signs often, which can lead to hypertension. Now, those particular things may happen more often or more prone in the Black community, but it's not just because I'm Black that gives me the high blood pressure. That is the complexity of the intersection between DEI and healthcare. It's not just talking about health disparities, but social determinants of health and how we can have health equity. Other things to talk about with your students in regards to the complex intersection between diversity, equity, and inclusion and healthcare are is this non-inclusive list. This is definitely not everything, but going over the changing population in the United States and the demographics of certain populations in which your students have clinical. Again, talking about health disparities and how it relates to these diverse populations. Aspects of diverse cultures and how culture influences attitude, behaviors, and expectations related to health, medication, and treatment. We wanna talk about communication skills and different ways to make sure that our patients understand what's happening to them. We wanna talk about how and when to utilize interpreter services, how to address confidentiality concerns, and how to meet diverse needs of our patients. And all of this starts in the classroom to lay the foundation, to let your students know that this is an expectation in nursing practice moving forward. And so with that, we want to make sure that our students have an understanding of infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion with patient care, and that the outcomes of this improves communication, increases patient satisfaction, and delivers higher quality care. So here are some things that you can consider in your uh, school, in your classroom, at your university or college. 
follow these steps to create a foundation on ways that you can start incorporating diversity, equity, and inclusion into your curriculum, thereby into the nursing practice of your students. First and foremost, look within. Know your own baseline. Within your school, within your program, within your classroom, do you understand the culture of um, your your organization as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Is there a DEI committee? Are your students a part of infinity groups like the Black Nurses Association or the Hispanic Nurses Association? And if so, how are these associations being supported? Are you able to identify and measure success by implementing certain interventions to make sure that there are best practices to drive diversity, equity, and inclusion success, meaning, how many diverse students are enrolled in your program currently right now? And with that, what are some metrics to make sure that you have a certain percentage of students from a certain background to add to this population of your students? Does this also mean that there is financial aid for these particular types of students to help with the equity in getting them into your program? Research shows that there are more African American and Hispanic students in LPM programs than there are in BSN programs due to financial situations. This is true for ADM programs versus BSN programs. And so if we're saying that the BSN degree is the gold standard in nursing and magnet organizations are only hiring BSN nurses, then in order for us to diversify the workforce, the pipeline starts at the nursing school. And so how are we getting diverse students into nursing school, thereby making the workforce diverse when it's time for them to graduate and work in a hospital setting? We also want to look into your leadership commitment. Is your program coordinator, your dean, the president of your school, fully committed to setting the tone of having diversity, equity, and inclusion be a part of their mission, a part of their mission statement, and a part of their culture and practice as a school and as a group? Once your leadership sets that commitment, it sets the tone for the rest of the faculty and the students to follow suit. And then lastly, required education. Most textbooks have a few chapters about cultural competency, and those chapters, to be honest, are very, very stereotypical and has broad overview of um, different things that cultural and religious sects do, but they're not totally honest. We know that people are not a monolith and not all Black people act the same. Now all Jewish people act the same. Now all Hispanic people act the same. So how can we broaden those few pages in that one chapter, in that one book, and make sure that your students are completely aware about microaggressions, implicit bias, prejudice, discrimination, cultural humility. So training and education should be required in all levels of nursing school, as well as for faculty as well, to make sure that amongst your peers as faculty and professors, that implicit bias is being recognized, cultural competency is being recognized, and that you know what microaggression looks like because that can hinder the learning and the growth of your student. So to summarize, we want to make sure that we understand true definitions of terms when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion in order for us to have open and honest dialogue because social interpretation of these terms may not always correlate with the true definition. So in order to level set, we want to make sure that we're speaking the same language and we're meaning the same things. Also, diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts should not be taught from a patient's point of view, but also from a future nurse point of view and letting your student know what the expectations are before they get into practice. And lastly, diversity, equity, and inclusion is not about food, flags, or fun. Celebrating and recognizing certain months of the year because they're highlighted or designated to a certain group. For example, February being Black History Month and that being the only time that we talk about nurse leaders and trailblazers instead of throughout the year. 
having continued conversation and making diversity, equity, and inclusion a structured focus in your curriculum and in your culture will role model to your nursing students what this looks like when they become a full-time professional nurse and be able to incorporate that into their practice. So I hope this session was insightful and informative. Definitely feel free to contact me for more information on ways that you can incorporate diversity, equity, and inclusion into your curriculum. You can find me on LinkedIn, on my website, or on social media at New Nurse Academy. Looking forward to talking with you for session two. See you soon. Okay. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just waiting for Tiffany to pop on. Hang on one second. As I figure this out, here I go. Hi, Tiff. Hi, how are you? It's nice to see you. Yes. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was absolutely, um, it, was, it was excellent. I was excited to listen to it. I hope that everybody else enjoyed it. Um, I know that we do have some questions. Wow. We got a whole bunch of questions at the end, actually. Um, so if you don't mind, I'd like to hop right in. Absolutely. Okay. So uh, one question. Um, any hints on how to close the achievement gap for our DEI students? Oh, great question. So before I answer, I just want to, because we just talked about terminology, to really go over DEI students. So are you talking about a diversity, equity, and inclusion student? And if so, what does that mean? Um, and so any ways to close that gap? So what does your admission process look like? Are there specific marketing efforts to approach uh, students in certain area demographics or population that you were looking to bring into your school? So whether that be more males, whether that um, are more Latin or Spanish speaking or whatever it is that you feel is missing in your particular program, what is marketing doing to um, enhance those candidates into getting into your program? Also, and this is another discussion, um, think about what your admission process looks like because sometimes there are implicit biases inside the admission process within itself. If you think about um, some of the testing, the standardized testing um, and requirements that are needed to enter nursing school, for some people in underserved uh, communities, it's difficult for them to pass standardized tests, not because they're unintelligent, just because of the nature of the standardized tests and their academic history. So two things, are you purposely promoting and, and having targeted marketing to these populations? And then the other thing is, is there anything within your admission process that can hinder these students from being accepted? And then what about laying the groundwork? Say that you've you've invited these students in that that you 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 kind of can see that that you have invited more diversity into your program. Um, if you're if you're uh, the question uh, had a little more to do with closing that achievement gap. So once you have students in, if you find that there is an achievement gap, what can you do to to further assist those students and close that gap? Absolutely. What I find is helpful um, in in the workplace and in the academic space is affinity groups. Because what happens is students who are coming from underserved backgrounds or, or diverse populations may have some additional things that they are facing psychosocially that is preventing them to, to achieve to certain standards. And so having affinity groups where they are able to vent on a psychosocial level, some of the things that they're going through, whether that's personally, academically, professionally, and then we can see where there are some needs for support or resources and things of that nature. That may help. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, another question is, um, any, please share a misinterpretation of DEI terms that you've heard or used. Mm -hmm. um, so one is, is diversity, right? And so using that as a catch-all for everything um, or using the word minority, that is another thing too. So if you think about the, this, the number 
of people who are African American slash Latino, Latina in the United States, the numbers are astounding. There's nothing minor about them. The word minority lets you know, it infers that if I'm a minority, then who's the majority? And if we're not talking about population size, then what are we referring to, which goes back to the social construct of racism. And so terms like that, minority, um, using even underserved, I try to say underprivileged um, or under-resourced is, is the new terminology that I find myself using now, um, just because it's, it's not that I'm necessarily underserved um, or uh, underprivileged, it's I, there, there isn't any privilege, <laughs> there isn't any. And so I'm underserved because there isn't any accommodations made for me. So those are some terms that I currently hear right now that can be misconstrued, but also, um, and, and it's not that it's bad that they're misconstrued. It's, it's difficult to talk about race and it's difficult to talk about prejudice and discrimination. And so when trying to have these challenging conversations, how can I do it in a way that doesn't ruffle too many feathers and that it, it doesn't offend anybody? That's the other thing too. Example, do I say black or do I say African-American? Right, that, that's another one too. Well, you say what the person requests. And, and, and that's what it is. You, you call people what they want to be called. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Under-resourced is a new term for me. I just wrote it down so that I don't forget it. Thank you for that. Um, how can we uh, encourage and convince nursing faculty that it is a good thing to have nursing students get involved in SNAs? Oh, so convincing is a strong word. <laughs> Because in convincing, you are you are forcing someone to change their mind, right? And so I, I would like to use the word persuade. And so, <laughs> so it's, a, it's a little bit different where I'm sharing my argument and I'm sharing the facts about my argument and the benefits about my side. And then it's still up to you to make that decision. And so with any type of argument, if you are sharing two sides and you want to persuade the other person to kind of take more consideration into your side, what are the benefits? You know, like, so, so what, what are the benefits and, um, and what are the outcomes and the transformation? So not necessarily the objectives, because it's not the objectives while people join or do things, it's the transformation. So after I do this, after I join this, after I learn this, what happens to me? What is the change that I'm going to see now with this new thing? And so in sharing the benefits via what is the transformation, then that can be a good persuasive argument. Excellent. Um, questions are still rolling in. If you have time for a few more. I do. Thank you. Um, how do we get leadership at clinical sites to be more inclusive and cultural? Oh, that's a big one. Yeah. I am such a proponent of the collaboration between leadership sites and academic sites. As a clinical instructor myself, there are times when I'm put into a facility and uh, there isn't really a good connection between the facility and the school other than the clinical liaison who does the scheduling, right? That, that's really it. And so how can there be more of a collaboration between the two where the school lets the organization know these are the current goals that we're working on with our students and this is how you can help us achieve our goals. Because if the school is gonna be a pipeline of workforce for the organization, then both need to be on the same page with hoping that the organization wants a very insightful and um, an empathetic employee. And so how do you get leadership involved? Well, first and foremost, in uh, retention. If I get someone who is considered diverse, right, for whatever their diversity is, into this organization and they don't feel included or they don't feel belonging, then they're going to leave. And so here we start with square one again with having to hire, having to train, and that costs a minimum of $45,000 per person per research, right? Um, so when I worked at the hospital and I was a clinical nurse educator and, and had to do orientation, every time we lost someone within the same year that we hired them, that was a minimum of a $45,000 loss. And so if you just show the numbers, <laughs> that's going to help with decision-making as well. Great. Um, somebody is asking about uh, if you know of any reasonably priced microaggression training programs. So just across the board, maybe um, for uh, smaller schools, um, 
a any any places that people could start looking for this kind of training additionally yeah so i'm going to plug myself and say me <laughs> New Nurse Academy, this is literally what I do. Um, an extension of me being an educator is being a diversity, equity, and inclusion consultant. And currently, uh, what I do is go into healthcare organizations and help them with diversity, equity, and inclusion strategies and how to integrate it into their culture so it's not performative, but it's actually a way of life. And so working with Unbound is one of the arms of my consul consultation in the education and awareness piece of why this is so important and why this is needed and to keep the conversation going so new nurse academy yes and contact me <laughs> um, okay just a maybe a couple of more um it this one is interesting previously the terms were edi and now we were we are speaking as dei what is proper um i know it shouldn't matter but just curious that's a good question i i hear it all edi um D-E-N-I, uh, D-E-I, I, I hear various um, variations of this depending on the industry. And so in healthcare, we say D-E-I or D-E-N-I, um, it's, it's all the same. And, the, and it's just an and, they'll, they're just saying the and. Uh, it, it doesn't, one isn't the better than the other because it's still saying equity, diversity, inclusion. Sometimes people will throw belonging in there to just mix up the letters a little bit, but it's the same. It's just depending on the industry. Um, I, let's see, well, English second language students do not fall under ADA for accommodations. Is there, uh, are there laws or documents that may help give support to these students in nursing programs? Many are unsuccessful due to time limits on, on NCLEX and nursing exams. Yes, yeah, so there isn't federal law in regards to uh, students who, who do not speak English as a first language. That isn't across the board. That is something that um, schools themselves will have to take on if an accommodation is needed. For if you think about um, K through 12, they have ELA programs. Um, English language arts program specifically for non-English, non-primary English speakers. But when it comes to the NCLEX, that is standard across the board. You have your certain amount of time depending on the NCLEX test that you're taking, and then that is that. And so what you can do is be proactive with that student. And when they are doing a practice test, either with Kaplan or ATI or any other NCLEX prep course, how can we help them with getting the timing uh, down. Some of the things that I've noticed personally in helping um, students that I've coached for the NCLEX was making sure that they understood terminology because that's where a lot of the, the time lapse was coming from. It's not that they didn't understand the concept of the question, it's that they were misinterpreting the words themselves and so that was taking up time. And so maybe just reviewing terminology. They understand the concept of the question in their language, but in, in translating that into English is where the, the the delay was. And so maybe in being proactive, some of the NCLEX prep can be uh, medical terminology as well and making sure that they understand that. That's an excellent, I would, had never thought of that. That's an excellent point. Um, another question, I've heard nurses say, I treat all my patients the same. Mm. But from what I understand, that's, the, that's not the way we should think. Can you explain why? Absolutely, so it goes with equity and equality. Um, if you have a patient who is a wheelchair user versus one who is independent, you're not going to treat them the same because one may be a two-person assist and one can do everything that they can. The difference between equality and equity is that while you may give all of us the same access, I still may need more accommodations. If you give me the link to this webinar to watch it, but you don't give me my glasses, well, thank you so much for the link, but I still can't participate because I can't see anything. So that's the difference between equity and um, equality. And so, yes, I treat all my patients the same. Everybody gets the same thing. Great. But this person has a special meal plan. This person cannot eat meat on Fridays due to their religious uh, beliefs. I can't see without my glasses. We all need something a little bit different to participate in the world as our full authentic selves. And that's really the basics and foundation between equity and equality. And so I go by the platinum rule, which is treat 
everyone the way they want to be treated. I know we go by the golden rule, um, mm -hmm. treat everybody the way you want to be treated, but the way you want to be treated may not be what I need. And so for me, I think if we all go through life with um, thinking about the platinum rule and just being equitable across the board and having human kindness, then that is a great start. I, I couldn't agree with you more. It, it does uh, lead me to one uh, other part of your presentation today, and that's going beyond equity into liberation. And I was wondering if that's a term that is um, being used within the nursing world or, or how, how you came upon that knowledge. So liberation is not a term that's used in healthcare, actually. Uh, I received the word liberation coming from a lot of the Black power movement mm -hmm. and just and just the freedom and what freedom looks like after being oppressed for so long. Because a lot of the oppression is systemic and systematic, what liberation looks like is complete removal of that. And so we don't have to worry about accommodations because I have the ability to get what I need in order to, to live life to the fullest. Um, so that's not a word that's often used in nursing because in nursing, there isn't any perceived barriers that will hinder our liberation or our freedom per se. However, when we think about all the different challenges that people have and privileges, and we all have privileges, um, it's, it's just how you use them. And we all need some accommodations. The word liberation is just more so it's out there, get what you need. And, and that's really the, the perception that I'm coming from with using that word. Excellent. Tiffany, I, I can't thank you enough for everything. I see people in the comments also agreeing. Yeah. Um, this was just excellent. I really can't wait to uh, hear the next part in our series for everybody who's still with us, which I think is almost everyone. Um, we will have uh, information about the next part of the series. Yes, to answer your questions, you will be receiving a copy of this presentation today. We'll be getting that out to you shortly. There's a, a quick survey at, uh, at the end of this presentation. So if you could just hang around um, as we conclude. Um, Tiffany, again, thank you so much for being here. I'm thank you. so happy to work with you and learn from you and with you. I really appreciate it. Um, and everybody look out for, for the email with our, our next present. Yes. I do though, before we go, I did see a one question. I don't know if we touched on it inside the actual Q and A portion. So the, okay. the Q and A portion, it says, what is the terminology that should be used when Caucasians are discriminated against? Um, and, and the terminology is discrimination. It, that's, that's it right there. You answered it right there. When you are um, behaving differently towards someone based on their race, that is discrimination. When you have preconceived thoughts, attitudes, or belief against someone based on their differences, that is prejudice. So discrimination is the, um, the action of prejudice. And so instead of using the word reverse racism, because that's not true, the word discrimination is used. Um, the other part to that question is, what is to prevent a person of color from wrongfully accusing Caucasians of assorted things such as racism when any response is seen as a microaggression or intolerance? Great question. I'm so glad you brought that up. Because um, treatment of how um, or wrongdoing is personal, Right. So th there could be actual factual things. So you didn't do this to me, but you did it to someone else. And both of us have the same things going on. Right. So so why did this person get this advancement and I didn't get this advancement and we both have the same exact score or whatever the case may be. Sometimes there's actual tangible things. In, t in working a lot with human resources, one of the issues that we have with discrimination cases is that a lot of it is not hard factual evidence that we can go back against. It's a lot of he said, she said, and feelings. And you cannot prevent someone from feeling a certain type of way. People interpret interactions based on their own experience. And so what we can do to be proactive in that is making sure that the people we are around feel included and feel have a feeling of belonging, but having constant communication and feedback. So even if there was a microaggression and you realize that the receiver of the microaggression felt felt it, you can, you can see their attitude change, there's something different in their energy. Just asking the question, did, did I offend you? Did something happen here? Do you need me to reword that? That wasn't my intention, let me clarify. 
even those little types of um, follow-up feedback can help break down misinterpretations. And usually that is the start of being wrongfully accused is the misinterpretation of the intent. And so it starts there. Um, and I believe that is it. Someone asked if they're getting the recording and the contact info, but you went over that already. So thank you so much, Hillary. You're Thanks. Getting, thank you for picking up on that other question. There were questions coming in and I appreciate that. <laughs> Tip, I will see you again soon. We will all see you again soon. Yes, thanks so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you.